right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? You all still excited to be alive? You know, I always tell people, if you are alive today, that is not an accident. It is not because God forgot to turn the off switch on you before you woke up this morning. It is on purpose that you are alive and awake this morning. Today we are going to be talking about a subject today that I, uh, that I found to be very interesting, and that is like a child. Now, some of you recognize in Scripture that Jesus often referred to his disciples as though talking to children. In fact, there are times where he actually says, little children, to his disciples. Keep in mind that Jesus, in his, at least in his, as far as his earthly form is concerned, was younger than some of his disciples, and he still called them children. He encourages us when we pray to say what two words as the beginning of our prayer? Our Father. Everything about the relationship with God is paralleled with the parent-child relationship. Last week, Pastor John was giving us a message about the family and how the family comes together. Today, we're going to be looking a little bit more at children. In fact, we have another series that will be going on, I believe that's next month, is that, yeah, in August, we're going to be doing a series on marriage, and we'll be focusing on marriage and the marital relationship, but today, we'll be focusing on the relationship with children. So today, we're going to be looking at like a child in prayer. So here I have a picture here, uh, and I was glad that the children's story talked about Daniel in the lion's den, uh, because this story is also, this brief story is going to be about a, light, a mountain lion and a bear. Now, bear cubs are small and cute and furry, and their parents are not. Well, they're furry, but they're just not that cute anymore. So when they're small like that, they need a little bit of help, because bear cubs are relatively helpless. So there's this little clip that I won't be showing you today, but there's a little clip with this bear cub that's running away from a mountain lion. I don't know how many people have seen that before, but it's like a scene, I think, from a movie, like they pieced it together. But it is the reality that bear cubs face because mountain lions and uh, black bears are like mortal enemies because they're competition for food. And so oftentimes if a mountain lion finds a stray cub, it will try to eat it. So in this particular scene, this mountain lion sees this bear cub and begins chasing it around, and the bear cub is pretty, well, helpless compared to a large cat. And as I've said before, cats are kind of mean and a little bit sadistic, so they really don't mind killing bear cubs, and no amount of cuteness is going to stop it. In fact, that just makes it look more delicious. Anyway, in this picture here, you can see where the, mountain, where the mountain lion is facing off with the bear cub. And the bear cub is, you know, trying its best to, to growl and use all of its aggressiveness to try to scare off the cat. But as you can imagine, a little cub roaring at a big cat is not only not scary, it's just kind of cute and silly. So anyway, the bear cub continues to try to do this, and the mountain lion starts pawing at its face. And then you see this facial expression on the cat, because something now has happened. And if you look at the picture below it, it looks like it's the bear cub, the little bear cub is scaring away the mountain lion, because it's just so fierce, right? Now, if you see that picture there on the bear cub's face, it's actually bleeding from being scratched. So why is it that the mountain lion is starting to run away. What spooked it out? That's right. You see that back there? Because when mom and dad show up, it's game over. The cat goes. You all probably noticed that small children are pretty helpless. Like, think about a small infant. If something came to attack it, is it going to be able to fight? No, it just screams and cries. Is it going to be able to run away? How long does it take before small infant children begin to walk? It's almost up to that first year, right? And sometimes it will be on just depending on how that, how that process goes. Children stay relatively helpless until they hit puberty for the most part, because even when we're smaller, we're still not that great at doing what we're doing. So safety for children is not found in the fight or flight response. Safety for children is found in the attach response. Think about it. What's some of the first things that a small infant is able to do? What's one of the first things it's able to do? It's able to like suck on its thumbs and fingers and grab. All of its behaviors are designed to attach. If you put your finger in, it, in that child's hand, it will squeeze your finger. How many parents remember doing that with their child when they first, yeah. And you notice that whatever, whenever they get a hold of you, they'll like, like try to bite you like my kid would like, you know, with his little gummy teeth would like uh, bite on my cheek and all this other stuff. It's just adorable. All of its behaviors are designed not to fight or to run, but to attach. And God tells us to be like little children. Happy Sabbath, everyone. 
Let's just say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll continue to the message for today. Father in heaven, help us to be like little children. Let us come close and attach ourselves to you today, that we may live a life without fear and hesitation, but one that is characterized by prayer and faith. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so since we have information to go through, I'll be moving through a little bit quickly. But our three main points will be to ask, seek, and knock. This comes from the passage that we have read already here. Um, but I was, so a couple things I wanted to share with you about children. I like this quote here. It says, the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. I thought that was really fascinating because sometimes we think work is the opposite of play. It's not. The reason why he says this is because one of the things that characterizes depression is a symptom that's called anhedonia, or in everyday language, the inability to experience pleasure. Play is completely characterized by motivation to just enjoy things. And you see this with your kids. Like, you don't, like when a kid plays a game they want to play, you don't have to like try to motivate them to engage in it. They're just naturally passionate about it. How many people remember like, you know, being like that? In fact, one of the things that they've been trying to capture is how they can teach uh, this little sign up there where it says National Institute for Play. There's actually an entire field of research committed to finding out what play, finding out how play works. Because one of the things they found is that if somebody can translate the passions that are demonstrated in play into their work life, then they're happier people. Now, my kids, like, they got to watch um, the, when they were, you know, taking down all the trees. They saw these guys, like, you know, using this big equipment and, like, cutting trees down, all that stuff. And I'm just like, dude, I know that guy in that truck is just having a good time. And you could tell he's just sw whipping this thing around, like, cutting trees. Like, his job, like, he goes to work and he gets to play. Wouldn't that be wonderful to get paid to do exactly what you enjoy doing instead of just following in the pattern that you are, like, supposed to go into? All right. Hopefully you all aren't regretting your career choices right now. Um, but anyway. So this is Dr. Stewart from the founder of the National Institute for Play. The next quote is from uh, the philosopher Plato, and I'm not recommending all of his writings, but one of the things he said was, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. And you know why? Because when people are actually like in the spirit of play, they're being genuine, yeah. Yes, the guard is down. The person is like disinhibited. You actually see who they are. We, we really organize ourselves really well before we have a structured conversation with somebody, right? Like when we go at the end of church and everybody's like shaking hands, you're going to put on your, your good face, the church face that everybody expects to see. But man, if we could actually be like children and just be who we are. Now, this does not mean to be immature. It's actually quite the opposite. Let's look at what Jesus said. He says, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given. Seek and what, everyone? You shall find, knock, and it shall be open unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Now he gives us injunction for how to pray. And then what's the very next illustration he gives? The illustration is, if a son asks bread of any of you, that is a father. So when he encourages us to ask, how does he want us to ask? The way a child asks their parents, not the way an adult asks another adult. You know what we do when we're adults? Like if I needed a ride somewhere, I might say, hey, man, you know, well, I got this thing coming up and, you know, I have a ride, but, uh, you know, I'll probably be okay. <laughs> God forbid we be direct. Children just say, I'm hungry, where's the food? Like, and they just say, just ask. Or if you ask a fish, will he give for him a serpent? If your son asked for these things, would you actually hand him, you know, the exact opposite of what he asked for? In verse 12, he says, or if you ask an egg, shall you offer him a, will you offer him a scorpion? I like Jesus' sense of humor, because if you really picture any of these things, could you actually imagine a parent, if, the, if, the, if my kid came up to me and said, Dad, could I have a piece of fruit, and I hand him a rock? Like, could you imagine how ridiculous that is? Or if you ask an egg, would he like, no, you can't have an egg, but I got this scorpion here. For, I mean, like, could you imagine doing something like this to your kids? And yet this is sometimes what we expect from God, right? Because like some people, they ask for stuff from God, and then they wait to be punished. Now, we don't want to admit that, but sometimes we do that. Like, we ask God for something, and things get difficult, and it's like, oh, I guess I must be wicked, and that's why he must have allowed all these terrible things to happen, because he just wants to punish me. But he says, I don't work like that. Isn't that good news? Now, there is someone who does work like that. In fact, if you look at the things that he just said there, it was a stone, a serpent, and a scorpion. 
Those are not coincidental things. In Luke 10 and 19, it says, Behold, I have given you power to tread upon serpents and snakes and over all the power of the enemy. So if you get scorpions and snakes, where are those coming from? Mm. All right. Jesus, when he was fasting, command that these stones be turned into what? Bread. Now, who offers rocks instead of bread? It's Satan. You see that? Scorpions, snakes, and stones come from the enemy. All right, free point, not part of the message, but work it in anyway. Mark chapter 10, Jesus blesses the children. In verse 16, it says, he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. I want you to notice this. The disciples were trying to say, get all these kids away from you, and he's like, absolutely not. And notice what he does with them. He doesn't just stand there and preach to them and say, okay, da 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 What does he do? He brings them close because he understands the primary need for children is not merely lectures and the ability to run fast and to be really tough in a fist fight. He realizes the most important thing you do for a child is to connect with them. So that's the first thing he does. Mm, okay. And when he had gone forth his way, I'm sorry, then the second thing it says that he did is he blessed them. Now the word there for blessed is contracted between two words, which I'll show you in a moment, but it means to speak a good word over them. And we'll come back to that point. Now here it is, that all these children come running to Jesus, and he scoops them up in his arm and blesses all of them. And I want you to notice the very next thing that happens, and then I just want to ask you a question, why does this person do this? And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? How did this... Now, we know this is the rich young ruler. How did he approach Jesus? He ran. Can you all remember the last time you ran towards something? Probably not. For adults, anyway. My kids, I, they can tell them exactly when they did it. And you know why? She got wife five minutes ago. Because children aren't ashamed of what they want. Like, we want to just kind of, like, approach. We'll play it cool. You know, like, I see people do this a lot, too. Like, when they want to talk to somebody, they'll kind of hang out in the background because they don't want to, like, make it look like they actually want to talk to the person. So they just kind of, like, you know, just hang tight. And, like, they see their opportunity to try to go for it. And somebody else steps in, and they just, you know, kind of brush their hair away. You know, just do that thing that helps people not to think that they really want something. We're, like, ashamed to know that we want stuff. But guess what happened? This rich young ruler, he just saw all these kids running to Jesus' arms, and he was welcoming them. And he's like, hey, all right, man. Well, he's taking kids. Maybe, maybe he'll... Maybe he'll take me. Maybe he'll take me too. And it's a really powerful scene because it tells you probably what that young man was missing. It's one of the reasons probably why he wasn't satisfied with his life. Because you think if you're rich and wealthy and you have all that you need, you probably shouldn't be running to someone making a fool out of yourself. But it wasn't enough. And so he ran to the one thing that mattered. Let us ask like children. So the word there for blessed is a contraction of two words. It's the word is um, eulego, which is good, and logos, which is word. So it's a good word. So when he blessed the children, he spoke a good word over them. Now, the reason this is so important is that when you speak things to your children while they're still young, that forever becomes what they're familiar with, especially the things that you repeat often or say in a way that's dramatic enough so that it sticks out in their memory. Their brains are designed to make sure that they hold really tight to anything that had a profound impact on them or something that was repeated very often, okay? Now, what's really neat about this is that if you do this, people will gravitate toward what they're familiar with. So one of the things they did is they had people stand up and give like a public speaking because most of the time that makes people anxious. And I am no exception. I just really just happen to trust that God's gonna help me through this and uh, you know, he comes through. Anyway, the people stand up there and they give their public presentation. And what they did is they had the people listen to two different songs. And these were based on their generations from which they came. Some of you will be able to relate to these examples, and some of you will not. The first example that they had is they had, I think it was like, it was Backstreet Boys. Anybody remember them? Yes, all millennial-ish around age people are <laughs> shaking their heads. Yeah, Backstreet Boys, yes. And the other one was uh, Justin Bieber. It was like the baby song or whatever. I don't, I never really like got into any of that because that was after my, that was my post-church days and all this other stuff. But they played those two different songs, and only one of them actually experience a calming effect from one of those songs. And it depended on which one connected with their childhood. 
Now, what's neat about that is it didn't matter if they liked it. It was just that it was familiar that brought them comfort. Now, this explains some really bizarre behavior that sometimes we see. Like, some people will go through really terrible things as children, and then they'll go and marry their abusers or overcome them. But the reason for that is because it's familiar. And if something is familiar, we're automatically calmed by it, even if it doesn't make any sense to be calmed by it. So when Jesus gathers these children up into his arms, he makes sure to not just speak any old words, he speaks good words to them. All right. So let's ask the way children ask, and maybe if we're on the other side of it, let's speak the way Jesus spoke. So Jesus, master, have mercy on me. We're going to look at an example of a man who asked like a child, just like how the rich young ruler did. And they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho, his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Anybody ever wonder why they tell you who he is and who his dad is? Anybody ever wonder about that? I did. And suddenly, I, you know, I was like, why, why do they tell you who his dad is? Well, first of all, his name Bar Timaeus means Bar means son of, and Timaeus means Smith, right? Okay, so Timaeus actually has another meaning behind it. The name means ethically or religiously impure. And so you're introduced to this man whose parentage would point in the direction of one who grew up in an ethically and religiously impure environment. Everything else after this is good news. Because that might be any and all of us, maybe to some degree. And if there's hope for Bartimaeus, the son of defilement, the son of uncleanness, the son of ethical or religious impurity, then maybe there is hope for us as well. And if you want to have the hope that he had, you're probably going to want to ask the way that he asked. All right, everybody still there? Yes, okay. And when he heard it, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to do what, everyone? Cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, you all notice children really are unashamed to cry out for their parents and to say things like, you know, even the middle of church and things like that. Children are not ashamed to ask for the things that they really need. No shame whatsoever. They just shut everything else out. And there's a really good reason for that, incidentally. Because when the person with whom they are attached is present, their fear disappears. In fact, this is just free information. Did you know that you have parts of your brain that are designed to respond to fear, like your amygdala, anybody that cares, your limbic system, your fight-flight system? And then you have other parts of your brain that are designed for attachment like your medial prefrontal cortex and some of your ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, all these other pieces of your brain designed to help you connect. After children are born, those parts of their brain that are designed for fight and flight actually begin to shrink because the very stuff that helps to get that part of the brain active is actually intentionally suppressed so that they don't spend so much time being afraid and they spend a lot more time trying to connect. Now, if that goes sideways, where there's no one to connect to, then those other parts of the brain, the fight-flight stuff, really begins to increase its production, and all the stuff that helps with thinking and planning and connection goes down. Children who miss out on having the safety of connection also miss out on all kinds of other things, like the ability to regulate their emotions, and it also causes decreases in IQ, performance, and likelihood of success in later parts of life. Huge difference, right? It is in that safe environment where there is one with whom we can connect, where we are free to ask without fear. And good for us that even if you were like Bartimaeus and maybe you came up in an insecure environment, or maybe like me, you realize that there's points in parenting where you didn't provide the safest environment for your own kids, that there is a father in heaven who can be that secure place from which anyone can ask. Because blind Bartimaeus is a grown man, which means the childhood stuff is over. And his, but that does not mean his chances in life and success are over. Amen. There is still hope for the one who is a son of one who is ethically and religiously impure. If he will ask the way a child does. 
verse 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Brothers and sisters, do not allow social pressure and expectation to limit your expectations from God. I'm going to show you some really quick examples. Abraham also learned to ask like a child. Genesis chapter 15, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram, saying, Fear not, Abram, for I am thy what? Thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, what is the purpose of a shield? It's protection. It's interesting. And Abraham said, Lord, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of, of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy bowels shall be thine heir. Now, check this out. And he brought him forth abroad. Now, this is the next thing that God does with Abraham. It says, he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said, so shall I seed be. So, but I want you to think about this the way that a parent would with their kid, right? It's like, hey, man, come on, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Right. Now, look at this right here. Look at, look at all those stars. Anybody ever seen some of these pictures of like some of the, the pictures of like the galaxies and all that stuff? It's really incredible. There's one particular picture that if you look at it, you can see like something like 500 like galaxies in this one little snapshot. Now, the snapshot where it looks like there's a bunch of stars, each one of those things that they thought were stars are actually galaxies. And the size of that picture is the size of the tip of an eraser held out at arm's length. And that's how many galaxies are found in one little spot in the middle of the sky. And so God comes to Abraham and says, think big. Look at this. And look at Abraham's response. And he believed in the Lord. And what did he do? Counted as righteousness. Because anybody who believes what their dad says like that, their father in heaven, I can use him. I can believe like a child. It's like that. You see those stars, son? That's where you're headed. Encourage your children to believe in something greater. All right. Point number two, seek. We want to seek like children. Scientists at UCL, uh, that's University College of London, have found that the link between what we expect to see and what our brain tells us what we actually saw. The study reveals that the context of surrounding what we see is all important, sometimes overriding the evidence gathered by our eyes and even causing us to imagine things which aren't really there. Now, let me just explain that in just the best language I can. You tend to see what you expect, so much so that you can miss what's really there. And this is true like in regular visual tasks. Like if I show you a picture with a whole bunch of people in the picture, and then I say one of them is holding a clamshell, you probably would not notice the clamshell because you're not expecting to see it in the picture unless they're near the ocean. It could be completely out of context. Now one of the things that happens here is that your brain automatically fills in the blanks. Now you don't notice this right now, but you have two massive blind spots right now that are in your visual field, and you cannot see them. There's a couple reasons why you cannot see them. One of them is because your eyes move in like a saccade, which means that they kind of move back and forth, and it's kind of like it colors in the lines and fills in the blanks. Can anybody see your blind spots? That means your brain is working, right? Now, here's the thing. When you're young, that pre-programmed fill in the blanks thing is working very minimally. So children sometimes are way better at spotting new things than adults are. As you get older, you start filling in the blanks more and more and more with assumptions. Now, that's probably not surprising to any of you, is it? You ever found that it's harder to convince you of things when you're older? And some of you who have older friends or are older yourselves, you realize how hard it is to persuade people to change their minds about stuff? It's because most of what is there is a bunch of assumptions about what should be there and not about what actually is there. So we may all be a little bit blind, like Bartimaeus, but not because we can't see, but because we can't see past what we don't expect. We can't see past what we do expect, I should say. All right, everybody still following? Amen? This is just a nice little optical illusion that shows the same thing. All those pillars or all those ships, you be the judge. So can we see and seek like children? In Mark chapter 10, verse 20 and 21, after this rich young ruler comes to Jesus, just like we had read before, it says, he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I've observed from my youth up, because he tells him, like, look, just keep the commandments. He lists the ones, and he's like, look, I've been doing that since I was a kid. And again, he makes reference to his childhood on purpose. 
Then Jesus beholding him, how does it say he beheld him? He loved him. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up a cross, and do what? Follow me. So we looked first at the asking. But now after we ask, what's the very next thing that Jesus tells people they need to do? They need to seek. Now here's the searching part. And Jesus says, okay, if you really want this thing, first you got to get rid of all the stuff you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you a question. How badly do you want your prayers answered? Are you prepared to move away all the stuff that you're familiar with so that you can see what you're really asking for? He was not... Because it says this rich young ruler went away grieved because he had much possessions. The way I believe it's Luke's account says, it says he was very grieved because he was very rich. And it says that on purpose because both of those things are in proportion to one another. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. When Jesus says, ask and it shall be given unto you, it does not say ask and it might be given unto you. The language there is legal language. When you say shall, that means absolutely will happen. Now, this does not mean you could just ask just any old thing of God, like I ask for a Porsche, because when we ask, we're supposed to ask according to his will. But when we are asking in accordance to his will, it's not maybe, it's shall. Now I want you to notice this, the rich young ruler asked, how does he have eternal life? Jesus answers question. He did, but when it came to searching time, what did the rich young ruler do? He ran away, or actually it says he walked away. He was back to adult life after that. No more running like a child after that, because now it's time to live in, like, the big world. I remember somebody actually had a quote saying that adults are the corpses of children. I like that. Because children seem to be the only ones that really understand what it means to be alive. He ran to him like a child, and he walked away like a depressed adult. Everybody still following here? Everybody's here? Yep. So how do you want to be? The searching part is actually probably the hardest part to getting your prayers answered because oftentimes we search in a way that suits us. Listen to what it says about Esau. It says he sought the blessing carefully with tears, but he sought it from the earthly father. Check this out. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17, speaking of Esau, it says, For you know how that afterward when he, that's Esau, would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. It's like, wait, God, I thought you said if you search for it, I'll find it. But there was a problem with how he searched. Now, I want you to notice this. In Genesis 27, and verse 34, you can see how he searched. And when Esau heard the words of who? His father. He cried with an exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me, O oh my father. Like he is crying out. But to who? To his earthly father. But from whom? was the blessing truly bestowed? It was from God. So what was the problem with his searching? He was searching from the wrong source. Let's look at another example. Judas, he sought earnestly for forgiveness and repentance. But where did he seek it from? Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 and 4. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought him again the 30 pieces of silver to who? To the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And it was then that he hung himself. But where did he seek repentance? Where did he seek forgiveness? From the priests. Side note. Priests cannot offer you forgiveness. Mm -hmm. There is only one person that could have offered him forgiveness. Yes, that would have been through Jesus Christ if he should have sought after the Father, but he sought repentance from the priests. Esau sought repentance from his earthly dad. But when we search, we're not searching for what this world can provide. We are searching for what? We're searching for God. Abraham, same mistake. Now, Sarah, as Abraham's wife, had no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Abraham, behold, Thou, uh, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto thy hand, my, my handmaid, that, it might, that I might obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto who? Sarah. And who does Sarah seek to get a child from? 
her handmaid. And who did she make her petitions to? Her husband. Now, do you see the problem with her searching extravaganza here? All the wrong people. That is not from whom we are supposed to search for the blessing. Because the blessing comes from God. Now, Bartimaeus sought like there was nothing to lose. Unlike the rich young ruler, he cast aside everything that might be in his way. Look at Mark chapter 10, verses 49 and 50. And Jesus stood still after he would make all this noise and continued to cry out the louder and commanded him, that is Bartimaeus, to be called. Now, when Bartimaeus had his chance to come to Jesus, he didn't say, well, maybe somebody, can, maybe somebody else can, can go and take care of this one for me. Or, or maybe, you know, maybe Jesus come over this way and I don't have to do all the searching. That's not what he did. Look what it says. And they call him to the blind man, no longer calling him Bartimaeus, by the way. And you actually don't see them call him that for the rest of the story, which is really fascinating. Saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he did what? Casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. He cast aside everything that would get in the way. How badly do you want to see it? When you ask for something, are you willing to cast aside everything that might get in the way of receiving what God has promised? All right. Knock. Knock like a child. Now, friends of ours and, and the mind, and, and when, you, when a child comes to the door to knock, how do they knock? And then what do you eventually have to say? That's enough. <laughs> I think they know we're here. Children knock like everybody wants to hear from them. Like they almost knock as though they, they expect that everyone was anticipating their arrival. Hebrews chapter 4 it says, Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Come boldly how? Maybe like children. wish I could say more. Luke chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. I want you to notice how Jesus moved forward. He knew that everything that he needed came from God. And it's one of the reasons why you do not see Jesus cowering in fear to any of the circumstances through which he went. It's the reason why children are so bold and fearless. The reason they're bold and fearless when they can have that kind of experience is because they trust you as their parent. Anybody remember having like the my dad can beat up your dad conversation <laughs> with, other, with other kids? Like I know that right now I'm probably physically in a much stronger place than my dad is right now. But my dad is still like huge in my head like, you know, and that doesn't mean everything was perfect for me growing up. It's just that relationship never really kind of disappears. I want you to notice how Jesus went around doing stuff. This is, this is going to be a few zap examples, but I'm going to show you why it is that you can really walk through this world fearless. In Luke chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, and the people in the, in the synagogue had rose up, and they thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him how? Dead long. They're just going to chuck him down head first. And as far as we can tell, Jesus doesn't do anything about it. So they take him all the way to the brow of the hill, like they take him all the way over there, and they're about to just dump Jesus over the edge. And then look at what it says. But it says that he doing what? He just passed on through. He's like, nope, not today, and just walked right through them. Anybody ever just like, consider what that must have looked like? You know, it's a mob of people. It's not like he overpowered them. It just says, it, he gets to the edge, and he's like, that's not my destiny today. And he turned around and just walked away, and nobody could do anything about it. How did that happen? Remember that first picture we saw? Because they all look tough until Dad shows up. Oh, man, hope you're all excited. John chapter 8, verse 58 and 59, and Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And he makes this proclamation, declaring himself to be God. And then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus did what? Hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, we don't even know what that means. Like, <laughs> like how do you hide? And, like, if I tried to hide, do you think y'all would be able to find me? 
It's really easy, especially there's so many of you. It's just like, you know, if I run back there, you know exactly where I am. But for some reason, Jesus just like, you know, he walks behind this little thing over here and he's gone. Who's taking care of him? John chapter 10 and verse 39. Therefore they sought again to take him, that is Jesus. And then what happened? He escaped out of their hand. Couldn't hold on to him. John chapter 7, verse 30, it says they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. And so his father just said, no, it's because I said so. That's why you're not, no one's going to be able to touch you. And some of them who would have taken him, uh, some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Look at this one. And it says, then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, why have you not brought him? And look at their answer. The officer said, never man spake like this man. Now, it's not just the words that he said, it was how he said them. And he talked all the time, like his big dad was standing right behind him all the time. And people were just like, man, you can't, what are you going to say to that guy? He's, he's fearless. Someone has his back. And lots of examples, we'll just have to skip through the rest of them. Knocking like a child. Now, I remember what I said there in the beginning is that for children, they don't find their safety in being able to fight or run. Where do they find their safety? It's in attaching, right? They have to make that connection. I want you to notice this, because Jacob picked up on this. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, that is, the angel saw that he didn't prevail against Jacob, it says he touched the hollow of his thigh. And look at what happens here. And his thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Now let's just fill in the blanks here. Jacob starts out trying to get the blessing from God by fighting. But when he realizes who he's wrestling with, how does he end his fight? He no longer fights, he no longer runs, but he attaches himself to Jesus. Hmm. He refuses to let go, like that child who grabs onto the finger, like that child who runs and grabs onto their mom's skirt, whatever that thing is, that is what he did. And like any good parent, who sees that their hurting child is holding on to them like their life depended on it. Jesus shows up and he blesses him. And so will it be if we seek after God like this. And brothers and sisters, it's not too late for you to become one of his children. We do not have to be moved by fear, but a desire to attach. The blind Bartimaeus, when after he comes to Jesus. Jesus asks him, what wilt thou that I should do unto you? He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He says, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. He tells him, look, now you can go on and do whatever you want. But you know what it says after that? It says that he followed him in the way, which means he attached himself to Jesus. When we get to this place of knocking, after we've done due search, and after we've cast aside everything that is out of the way, after we've gotten over ourselves enough to just ask God for what it is that we really need, asking in accordance to his will and expectation, then we can also do what Jacob did and hold on to him who promised the blessing. And it is never too late for you to attach. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 3 through 6, it says, Even so, we, when we were children, were under the bondage of the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that he might receive, that he might receive what? The adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, he has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. That's the way children talk to their dads. It's like daddy. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to what? To fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. No more fight, flight, but now attach, connect. Anybody want to be like a child? We need to have the faith of a child. If my dad is here, then I'm all right. Maybe we can say what is written there in Luke 137. I'm not afraid of my circumstances. I'm not controlled by the things that happen to me. Whether I'm sick or I'm in health, whether I'm injured or I'm whole, whether I'm single or I'm with someone, in every condition I might find myself in, I know I'll be okay. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And I considered Jesus. 
And Jesus was in the trial of his life, the worst agony he can possibly be in. There was only one thing that he sought after. It says, and he went forth a little and fell on his face to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, what two words there? Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. You notice that? He looked at his father the same way he encourages us to. He says, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus was willing to do whatever it took to please his father because he was not interested in fighting back or running away. He was interested in maintaining his connection with his father. So my prayer for you all today is that we would learn to ask and seek and knock with the persistence, the humility, and the love and longing and desire of a child. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your promises. We thank you so much that you have invited us, Lord, to come to you as children. I pray for our children that are here now, that they would learn even now to trust you. And I pray for their parents, Lord, that they would be models and examples of our Heavenly Father. And I pray for us, Lord, that whether it's us or some of our adult children or whomever it is that we might be reaching out for, Lord, if we are like blind Bartimaeus, who's that son of what was ethically impure, everything maybe was done wrong, maybe we were the ones that did it all wrong, however that is, Lord, I pray that every person would know that Jesus is passing by, and that we would unashamedly cry out and ask for your help, Lord, casting aside everything that would get in the way, and persisting, Lord, in holding on to you, knowing that our safety does not come from running or from fighting the way that the world fights but by holding on to you. And I pray that every soul that desires this would hold on to you today and that you would reach out your hands and take us into your arms and bless us and ask for this blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen.